And now it's my pleasure to give the floor to our first uh, speaker, Pavel Potutak, who is going to speak about <coughs> demand for money and uh, Hayekian triangles. So, Pavel, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. I'm from the University of Economics in Prague, but at the moment, the family reasons sent me to Krakow in Poland. So let me introduce my presentation. Let me just check whether you can see it, the PowerPoint yeah. presentation. Yeah, it's good, we, we see your slides, thank you. Great, thank you very much. So my topic is the demand for money triangle. Let me natural level and the consequent changes in the structure of production are depicted in the Hayek triangle. Well, I will demonstrate that shocks to the demand for money to velocity of circulation might have similar effects as shocks to the money supply. And Hayek in 1935 in his prices and production or earlier, earlier publications, he recommended to stabilize the product MV and time suite to prevent economic fluctuations. So not only to stabilize the money supply, but the stream of money represented by the term N times V. However, Hayek never used his triangles to depict processes in the case of the money demand shocks. And that is the objective of my paper, to present shocks to the velocity and how they affect the structure of production. And the changes in the structure of production will be depicted in the Hayek triangle. Very quickly, let me go over over this Austrian business cycle theory that distinguishes sustainable and unsustainable growth. Sustainable growth may be provoked by a fall in time preference, which leads to a lower demand for present goods, consumption and greater demand for future goods. We can call it saving. This results in the fall in the market as well as natural interest rate, which leads to greater investment spending. And this initiates a longer processes and longer processes used released factors of production from consumption stages. And at the end of the day, there might be a greater output of consumption goods in the future, and then the greater demand for future goods is thus satisfied. Unstable never growth, at the, on the other hand, starts with the rise in the money supply, which results in the fall in the market interest rate below the natural level, but market interest rate falls as if lower demand as if there was a lower demand for present goods and greater demand for future goods. So the process should be similar. There will be greater investment spending. Longer processes use factors for production from consumption stages. But at the, at the moment when workers receive new money in this process, they will reestablish the initial relative demand between present and future goods. The interest rate rises back to the natural level and some longer processes will be abandoned. Yeah, and this is the starting point of the crisis. This is the well-known Austrian business cycle theory that is caused by the monetary supply shock, money supply shock. Here is the graphical representation. With the money supply shock, the Hayek triangle is being lengthened, monetary expansion resulting in a decrease in the interest rate eventually to a more roundabout process of production. But at the end of the day, the Hayek triangle gradually draws up as consumption demand is intensified and the increase in the interest rate somehow erases the earliest stages of production. So this is the graphical representation of the standard Austrian business cycle theory. Uh, we can also depict this theory in the textbook ISLM model. So monetary, we are in the space interest rate output. At the intersection of the IS curve and potential output, we can indicate the natural rate of interest. And the economy starts at point A, monetary expansion shifts the LM curve to the right and the interest rate falls below the natural level. And the economy is booming, the economy is booming to point B, so output two is greater than the potential output. There is an unsustainable positive output gap. But in the Keynesian or textbook macroeconomic theory, sooner or later prices will go up, the LM curve shifts back, the economy moves back from Y2 to Y1 and the interest rate goes back from R2 to the natural level. Yeah, so there was a boom and then the resulting recession. This model to be more in line with the Austrian theory. In the Austrian theory, some of the initiated processes will collapse. Part of the capital structure will collapse. So 
to depict this approach in the textbook model, we can say that the potential output in the recession falls down, according to the Austrian theory. So Y1 star, which is the potential output, shifts to the left. And at the same time, there might be some collapse in investment spending. So the IS curve shifts as well. So, you know, the money supply shock can leave permanent scars on the economy and maybe in deep depression, the natural rate of interest may fall, which is maybe what we observe today or in recent financial crisis. Now let's move to the demand for money. The previous story was about the money supply shocks. Let's talk about the demand for money shocks. Let us represent a st steady state of the evenly rotating economy where the flow of incomes of agents is as follows. People earn 10,000, let's say every month. They allocate 8,000 on real consumption goods. I will write to stress real consumption goods and they save 2,000 again in most probably in real consumption, uh, in real goods, but uh, these savings are transmitted through the financial system, so they buy bonds. But at the end of the day, they want to buy future real consumption goods. At the same time, let's assume is constantly allocated between consumption and saving. And now an exogenous shock to the demand for money occurs. Suppose that their demand for money falls, so the stock of money they want to hold in their pockets falls from 20,000 to 19,000. And the key question is how this fall in the demand for money affects consumption and saving. Yeah, whether the whether this extra money will be spent on present consumption goods or on uh, future consumption goods. So let's start with this situation. Suppose that the representative agent buys 3,000 of new bonds. So the demand for future goods rises from 2,000 to 3,000. But this increase in the demand for future goods does not come from the reduction of the demand for present real consumption goods, but just from released money balances. Yeah. So the demand for present goods remains at the previous level. In that case, it is not the money supply shock, it is a velocity shock. Velocity of circulation rises, or if you want, the K parameter in the Marshall Cambridge version of the demand for money falls. People want to hold a lower fraction of their income in the form of money. So this velocity shock should have similar effects as the money supply shock. Interest rate falls below the natural level. And, you know, the Austrian business cycle should start. As longer methods attract factors of production, because of the fall in the interest rate. But again, when workers receive this new flow of money, the ratio between present goods and future goods should be reestablished. And with higher prices, people will be again satisfied with the 20,000 uh, units of currency they actually hold. Yeah. So even this shock to velocity may provoke the Austrian business cycle. That's the reason why Hayek recommended not only to freeze the money supply, but to stabilize the term and times we to prevent the business cycle. It's obvious that the capacity of banks to grant credit to increase M is much greater than money balances of people that can be released. So this kind of the business cycle should be milder than that one caused by credit expansion. Yeah. And we can also argue that it may be the, the other way around that shocks to velocity, uh, unstable money demand is caused by the business cycle. But here we started the story with the shock to the velocity to the uh, to the money demand that caused the business cycle. But there might be there might be repercussions. Another demand uh, shock to the demand for money. Let's assume the st same steady state. Agents earn ten thousand. They spend eight thousand on consumption goods, two thousand on saving, and their money balances are twenty thousand. They velocity, decreased demand for money. In this case, factors of production are attracted to late stages of production. But again, sooner or later, the initial ratio between demand for present goods and future goods should be reestablished. And we can argue that this uh, business cycle will be milder than the previous one due to the phenomenon of the irre irreversibility of time. It is easier to transfer present goods to future goods than future goods to present goods. Uh, this shock can be represented by a slightly different diagram. So increase in consumption demand from released money balances will make the Hayek triangle steeper rather than flatter. 
increasing demand for consumption goods raises prices in late stages and the structure of production will be temporarily shortened. And finally, again, let's start in this steady state in this evenly rotating economy. People earn 10,000, consume 8,000, save 2,000. In every period, they keep 20,000 in their pockets and suddenly money demand falls to 19,000. And let's assume that this fall in the money demand is proportionally split between greater demand for consumption goods and greater demand for saving or greater demand for future goods, so greater saving. I have a mistake in the paper. There should be 8,800, 2,200 to keep the previous ratio at a constant level. So C over S will be four as before. There will be a proportional increase in demand for both present goods and future goods. And how can we represent this type of shock? Well, if the proportional demand between present goods and future goods is, has not changed, the shape of the high triangle, the slope of the high triangle may remain the same. So in, firstly, increase in the demand for consumption goods raises prices in late stages, but at the same time, increase in saving results in lengthening of the structure of production. So the high triangle may expand, but with a similar slope. It might be interesting to depict this shock when fall in the demand for money also results in greater consumption spending in the ISLM model. So a fall in the demand for money shifts the LM curve to the right. So it's a similar graphical shift as increase in money supply. An increase in the demand for consumption good will shift the IS curve, right? This diagram suggests that the interest rate may stay at the same level. The economy is booming. This is also an unsustainable boom. So this diagram is in line with our previous picture of the Hayek triangle where the slope of the Hayek triangle remained the same. However, in the new Keynesian vision, the natural rate of interest is defined at the intersection of the potential output and the IS curve. And now we have the expansion of the IS curve. So the uh, Keynesian vision would be that the natural rate of interest rises. But in the Austrian vision, because this is a purely nominal shock, this is a shock to velocity, the natural rate of interest should remain the same. Yeah. So in this case, the textbook Keynesian model is not in line with the Austrian perspective. And the problem is that the two perspectives may define the nature of money differently. One school, Keynesian school, may define money as a future good as kind of saving Austrian school money might be the present good par excellence. So we need to, well, according to Keynes, allocation of income between consumption and saving depends on some psychological law. And the interest rate does not determine the split between consumption and saving. The interest rate just determines the split of saving between money demand and bonds. So interest rate affects the structure of saving, not the volume of saving. That's the Keynesian vision. So change in the interest rate does not affect the volume of saving, but the structure of saving. In this perspective, in this Keynesian perspective, money plays the role of a store of value, and it might be rather a future good, a future good. Here is a diagram of the Keynes approach. Psychological law determines how income is split between consumption and saving and the interest rate plays a role. It determines the allocation of saving between bonds and money. Yeah, whether we want to save in the form of bonds or we, we want to save in the form of money. When interest rate rises in the Keynesian story, the split between consumption and saving remains the same. So like saving was a vertical curve, interest rate has no impact on saving. It has an impact on the structure of saving. So when interest rate rises, people will save more in the form of bonds rather than in the form of money. The demand for money from the Misesian perspective, money, money is rather a present good. And the interest rate determines the allocation of income between consumption and saving. Yeah. So a change in the interest rate will affect the ratio between consumption and saving and or present good and future goods, and money is considered a present good, not a future good. So when the interest rate rises, people will 
increase saving at the expense of present goods and people may either decrease demand for present real consumption goods or they may decrease demand for money. So under what conditions the natural rate of interest can change in the Austrian perspective? Natural rate might be affected if the relative demand for present real consumption goods and future but the shocks might cause business cycle theory, business cycle, Austrian business cycle, that is however milder than that caused by the money supply shocks. I have also extensions in the paper, like uh, exogenous increase in the money demand. So far I've been talking about exogenous decrease in the money demand. In the paper, I also discuss exogenous technological shocks that increase the interest rate. And if the money demand is sufficiently unstable or you know, the LM curve flat, this may also cause a, quite a significant business cycle. So in, this ex in these extensions, I show again that the Austrian business cycle may develop even under the fixed money supply if the demand for money is sufficiently sensitive or unstable. Conclusions, the paper argues that the Austrian business cycle theory can be generalized to changes in the demand for money. The impact on the structure of production then depends on the paths through which hoarding or dishoarding operates. It is not clear how changes in the demand for money affect the natural rate of interest or the rate of interest. And the answer lies uh, in the nature of money, whether it represents present goods, future goods, or both. And there is an area for future research, maybe with the help of mainstream economics, when money is included in the utility function along with consumption, the definition of the natural rate of interest then opens areas for new research that might integrate findings of Austrian economists with modern DSG approach. So thank you very much for it. For your attention and I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions thank you very much thank you very much pavel for your nice uh, presentation we have now a couple of minutes to take some questions uh i don't know who can see when someone raised the hand i think it's sonsoles do you see that Or maybe I, I propose just to, to ask uh, to ask a question in direct if someone has uh, something to ask to, to Pavel. Yes, uh, Romain, sorry for the questions. I think uh, we can either use the chat as Brecht. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Everyone or you, can see that. Or you can raise your hand as you say and just say it out loud. I think both will. You are be. right. The, the chat is, is maybe better. But maybe as a first question, I would have a. Uh, questions or remark to you, Pavel, because when I, I read your paper, I, I thought that uh, to some extent you are quite uh, lenient towards the ISLM model. If you can show us, a big, we, do, we all have in mind the ISLM uh, chart, but what I was surprised is the effect of a credit expansion, that means a shift on the LM curve to the right, and in the ISLM model, you assume that when you have a credit expansion, that means a shift in the LM, LM curve, you stay on the IS curve. And the IS curve is the curve that says that investment equals savings. And I think what we must be aware of is that behind the hypothesis that the credit expansion leave you on the IS curve, behind that you have the Keynesian multiplier. Because, for example, you have a credit expansion for hundreds. If you assume a savings quote of 10, then you will spend 90, save 10, then spend 81, and so on. And the cumulative sum of 10, 9, and 8.1, 8 and so on, the, the cumulative sum of that uh, amounts to 100, which is the very investment at the beginning or the very uh, credit expansion at the beginning. So in order to stay on the IS curve, you have to assume that the Keynesian multiplier operates an, an infinite number of iteration within one second. So to be against concrete, you mean that you have a credit expansion of 100, savings code 10%. The ISLM model say you that the GDP is increasing by 10 times the credit expansions to 1,000. 
And this 10% savings of the thousands is the savings that need to generate the investment. So you can say on the IS curve. And already Hayek uh, mentioned that these hypothesis is completely absurd. It is not realistic that you will have an infinite amount of iteration within a second. To some, and if, therefore, when you have a shift in the LM curve, you do not stay on the IS curve. But when you have a LM, uh, shift on the LM curve, stay on the textbook idea of ISLM that uh, you always stay on the IS curve. I think it's, uh, um, you could be even more severe against or vis-a-vis -vis the ISL model. Do you want to react on that? So. Yeah, thank you very much for this notice. It's very valuable. But one can one can employ something like a dynamic ISLM when you can see the entire path of the economy or uh, include that kind of accel acceleration process in the Keynesian theory, like the greater demand for consumption goods results in greater investment and then back to greater demand for consumption goods. So then the impact will be even stronger in the Keynesian theory. And it is at odds with the arguments of Hayek in profits, investment and interest when he said that the acceleration principle is an abs absurd idea, right? Yeah, so I, I, I do agree with your, with your note and it can this, the paper can be extended by this more severe criticism of the ISL model. You still have maybe opportunity to ask uh, or to ask your question then by emails to to Pavel. But if it's not the case, I propose. So thank you very much, Pavel, for your very nice uh, paper and presentation. And thank now we're much. moving to the second uh, paper by Dante uh, Bayona, who will uh, ask whether free banking leads to inflation or, or not. So Dante, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We don't see you. <coughs> but can you see me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah. No, can you see me? Not yet. Yes, we see you. Okay, that's okay. Got it. All right. Good morning here in New York. Good afternoon in Madrid. My name is Dante Bellona, and I'm very happy of, uh, to be here with you. And the title of my paper is A Model of Free Banking Money, Inflationary or Not. There's something that happens in deposit banking, in deposit banking that doesn't happen in investment banking. In investment banking, when you go to see your financial advisor, he tells you that he's going to put your money at risk. He has to tell you that by law. It has to be written down on the prospectus, on his email, and it has to appear on the TV commercials. He has to have it on his desk everywhere. It has to say something like this. We are going to put your money at risk and you and we might lose your money. But in deposit banking, they don't do none of that. In deposit banking, they also put your money at risk, but they don't tell you anything about that. On top of that, they tell you that your money is in the situation and they wouldn't put your money at risk. Professor Jesus Huerta de Soto has explained that whatever passes for money today is not a deposit contract. Here, uh, I'm going to argue that since deposit banks don't do deposit contracts, they should follow the investment banking model. If they want money from the public uh, to put in risky ventures, they should raise money through bonds and stocks. Okay, so let's say that there's a change in banking law and banks accept or are forced to accept that they don't do deposit contracts. And let's say that they start raising money from the public through bonds and stocks. The question is, can we use that as a medium of exchange? Stocks are too volatile, but short-term bonds can actually work. Uh, Dante, we, may I ask you, interrupt you just a second. We don't see any slides from you. Do you have a presentation to share? No. Uh, okay, that's, uh, that's it. It's not a technical problem. Yeah, thank you. No. All right. So I was uh, saying, uh, people can actually write checks on the bonds that they have in the bank and then can pay with that. That's very simple. 
we should notice an important difference between bonds, stocks, and deposit banking. Uh, companies are not allowed to issue whatever amount of bonds and or stocks they want because that might dilute the value of the first bonds and stocks. But on deposit banking, they can print as uh, they can print any amount they want. So in that sense, bonds uh, are better than uh, deposit banking to issue money. Now, what type of bonds should we use to issue money? It has to be first, it has to be high quality bonds, no government bonds. 200 years ago in America, banks were allowed to issue money on government bonds. States told the banks, okay, if you don't have gold, you can issue money using our bonds as gold. But the states didn't do it just because they were good people. The states wanted to sell their bonds to build public roads, canals, and stuff like that. And banks became the recipients of all the junk short-term bonds or long-term bonds. Short-term bonds work better because long-term bonds tend to be more inflationary. To explain this, I'm gonna use a criticism raised, be raised before against the real bills. I'm gonna explain the inflationary feedback mechanism. Defenders of the real bills think that the amount of real bills depend on the quantity or only on the quantity of goods to be, to be produced. But the amount of real bills also depends on the future price of those goods. And those future, in that future price, those future prices uh, may also increase precisely because of the increase in the money supply. That is the increase in real bills itself. And that can lead to a collective euphoria and to a crash. We can uh, also see the inflationary feedback mechanism in the mortgage market today. When banks ex expand loans for people to buy houses, people buy more houses house prices rise due to the greater demand. And houses are perceived as more valuable because of the higher prices. People demand more houses because they think it is a good investment and banks print more money because, uh, print, more, print more money for the loans, to give loans to buy more houses. Mortgage-backed securities is another example of the inflationary feedback mechanism. Mortgage-backed securities began in the U.S. with the U.S. government. After the crash of 1929, the government told its agencies to buy mortgages from the banks. So with that new money, banks would give more loans. And with that, the money went for a second round, for a third round, etc. After that, the agencies packaged those mortgages and sold them to Wall Street. And decades later, private companies did the same, but without any control. Here we see an advantage of gold that real bills don't have. Gold is independent of the level of economic activity. Nobody printed more gold just because people wanted to. If banks want to issue money for whatever insane idea they have in mind, first they have to issue high quality short term bonds. During the crisis of 2000, 2008, banks were allowed to print an infinite amount of money for whatever, for very risky speculation. And that would have been very difficult if they had to raise funds with high quality bonds. Because first, they would have had to ask for permission, and then those had to be high quality bonds. At the, at the international level, countries could adjust their currencies to each other depending on the quality of their bonds. So you don't have to impose a currency on the other countries like the euro. And the most solid economy would have the strongest currency. Banks are still free to issue riskier bonds and stocks 
for whatever projects they have, but they cannot issue money on those bonds. Another point that I make in the paper is that the musician framework serves to analyze other aspects of the financial system. Not only fractional reserve, but also the capital requirements for loans. Here we're going to talk about the musician multiplier, which in mathematical form is the inverse of the fractional reserve. I call it the musician multiplier because it is a true multiplier of the economy. The Keynesian multiplier is not the real multiplier of the economy. Companies are allowed to use part of their capital as collateral for loans. And the capital requirement is the minimum level of that capital that they cannot use as collateral, that they have to keep it, that they have to keep for emergencies, just like the minimum amount of cash that deposit banks have to keep for emergencies, for bank runs. So the lower the level of capital requirements, the higher the amount of loans they can get, the higher the amount of money banks will create for them. It has a, multipli a multiplier effect. In the crisis of 2008, the most toxic banks had almost all their capital as collateral for loans. Lehman Brothers, for example. We have to make the distinction between fractional reserve and fractional capital reserve. Fractional reserve is used in deposit banking, but fractional capital reserve is used in investment banking, in shadow banking. We can imagine a situation where fractional reserve in deposit banking while and fractional capital reserve is only 10%. So even with 100% reserve in deposits, we could still have credit expansion in the economy. The capital requirements are established around the world by the Bank for International Settlements. And those requirements are very low. Now, is there something wrong with people using their assets as collateral? Not really. The economist Hernando de Soto wrote a book on this. His argument in The Mystery of Capital is that people in the third world countries have not been able to register their property in public records. And therefore, they have not been able to use that accumulated capital as collateral for loans. Now, this is important for this paper because banks might want to issue collateralized bonds. And that's it, that's my paper. Short-term bonds, short-term high quality private bonds could work as money, as a better type of money compared to what we have today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dante, for your presentation. Do we have some questions from the audience? I don't see a question now. So I would just ask you what would be your definition because very often we have a confusion or a debate about the definition of free banking. What would be your definition of free banking? Is it a system that respects private property rights or is it a business or is, is fractional banking, free banking or not? That's uh, I think uh, very often the source of confusion in the debate. What is your position on that? Uh, that's a really good question. Just give me one second. Um, um, uh, I haven't, uh, there's no framework uh, for uh, to analyze this. Now, what I, what I have thought, what I have in my mind about these issues is, uh, well, first we need to have a definition of money. Money as a medium of exchange, money as a store of value, and money as a unit of, uh, of accounting. Okay, so uh, free banking money that we have what we have now, what we understand now as free banking money, also what Professor White has in mind, he wrote that on his books, is that they think that money for them, uh, I mean, they emphasize the medium of exchange 
uh, money. So they don't they don't care about a store of money. So that's why because that's why for them anything that can pass as money, anything that can be accepted by as money is money. Now, uh, Rothbard, Jesus Huerta de Soto, they also emphasize, uh, I think, that's what I've noticed, they think that money is also a store of value. And that's a very important difference. For example, that's why in free banking, they think that, uh, they think that uh, Bitcoin is good money. But Bitcoin doesn't have any storage, any store of value sense. So that's how I see it. So it's not really free banking that is, um, it's kind of, it's kind of a, it doesn't have a precise definition, but for what of, depending on what we have now, what we see on Selgin, what we see on, on Professor White is, what we can see is that they only emphasize the property of a medium of exchange. And Cuerta de Soto or Rothbard, they emphasize more as a value and that's why they your paper is only in Spanish, is that correct? No, no, no. I know. Uh, two weeks ago, I sent the uh, English and uh, Spanish. Uh, okay, the first version was in, in Spanish, that's the reason. Okay, that's uh, why I remember that. Wrong. Yeah. So, do I think it's, uh, we don't have any questions from the meeting chat. If it's not the case, I would like to thank you, Dante, for your talk. You're welcome. And from uh, joining us from uh, from New York. So you are working in the banking sector. Or what are you doing in New York? I work in banking. Yeah, OK. In free banking, yeah. <laughs> OK, so thank you very much, Dante. And now we are going to move to the last uh, session of uh, last uh, paper of the first uh, session. A paper presented by Brecht Arnert on inflation and deflation, some market observations. And now, Brecht, um, I give you the floor and I look forward to your, to your talk. Thank you, Dante. Thank you, Dante. Thank you, Romain. Um, my name is Brecht Arnert. I'm a PhD student in the program uh, in uh, Rey Juan Carlos. I'm also the proud sponsor of this conference of the Macrotrends uh, Prize for the Development of Austrian Economics. This is one of the few conferences, I think, where new research is really presented, um, where we can have new ideas. And it, it, it is in that vein that I have also tried to come up with a new definition of, of, of deflation. So let's not lose any more time and start with my presentation. Let me see. Yes. Okay. The original title submitted was Inflation and Deflation, Some Market Observations. But I, as I was iterating, um, a better title would have so the water has been injected into the milk, let's say the inflation then evaporates. Um, and let's start with a, a couple of competing definitions of inflation. The mainstream definition is a general rise in the of the price level. And that's, that is measured by an end of the pipe measurement, the, the consumer price indexes. The Austrian definition is not about the end of the pipe, but the ex ante idea that uh, inflation is something you perpetrate, something you do, something you cause. It is a general increase in the money supply. So that is a big difference, ex ante, ex post. Um, and what I like about Austrian economics is that it is organic. You can find a lot of analogies with other um, um, realities. And so the metaphor we can use for inflation as we understand it uh, is simply adding water to the milk. You have one liter of water, uh, one liter of milk, you add one liter of water, and then you have two liters of milk. But of course, the nutritional value per centiliter has dropped. Mainstream does not have any imagery to support their uh, claims. It's a poor, poor way of looking at economy. Um, so for us, it's very important to state that inflation is not the rise in prices, but it's cause. Now, on deflation, the mainstream definition is quite parallel. 
It's a general drop of the price level. Again, no metaphor. Prices just drop. And they have some schemes like the ESLM model and stuff like that, but they don't have metaphors. And again, end of the pipe, they measure if the CPI is going down. The Austrian definition would then be a general decrease in the money supply. And the metaphor we could use is that water from that, um, you know, from that inflated milk is again drying out. So there you have a can of national dried milk from the Ministry of Food in the First World War. This, this is what you could see as deflation. Uh, and how do we measure that ex ante? Um, well, for now, let's say that that is impossible. You can never know how your inflation will cause deflation and how much deflation. That depends on the market conditions. But my question is, uh, can we speak of an analogy? Uh, if deflation is not a drop in prices, but maybe also the cause of the drop in prices. And I, I have trouble. Right. Excuse me to interrupt. We, we still, uh, the first of Oh, now we have, okay. sorry, because oh, you know, we had very nice slides. Yes. <laughs> well, I'll go through them very fast then. Um, I had some such, such nice imagery. <laughs> uh, do, do you see it now in, in this mode? Now, now we, we see them, yes, okay. Yeah, okay. let me do it this way then. Um, it's, it appears that full mode does not work. So let me do it in this mode, no problem. So uh, where was I? So competing definitions of inflation. Inflation is not the rise in prices, but it's cause. So we, yeah, I've, I've, I've lost a bit my train of thought now, but um, then we can go to the definitions of deflation. And the mainstream definition is a general drop in the price level. They have no metaphor, prices just drop. The Austrian definition concurrently would be a general decrease in the money supply. The metaphor we can use is that the milk, you know, the water in the milk that has been added evaporates again and you get uh, more condensed milk, you could say. Uh, and is there an ex-ante measurement possible? I don't know. But if you check this analogy, you really have, you, you will encounter problems because um, if you say that the inflation is not the rise in prices, but it's cause, then the analogy naturally would be Ah, deflation is not the drop in prices, but it's cause. And the more you ponder that, the more you realize that that is not the case. And so what I have come to and what I propose is that deflation is not the drop in prices, but it's consequence. So that is that is really strange. Deflation as the consequence of a drop in prices. Normally we would say the drop in prices is the deflation. Just but if we would say that, we would do exactly the same as the mainstream uh, economists who say that inflation is a rise in prices. We accept inflation causing a rise in the price level. But a drop in the price level causing inflation, that is really strange. So how can we understand this? Uh, you can understand this by, by, by looking at the economy from an entrepreneurial point of view. There are only two fundamental ways to make money. Um, either you have a high margin, uh, that is mostly the case with uh, new companies, small companies. They don't have a lot of volume, but they do have a high margin. Uh, or you can make it by having a high volume. You can still have a high margin, but that is rather the exception. When, it, when a company matures, it's mostly that they mostly play on volume. So if you uh, map that on a, on, a, um, on a continuum, what you actually see in the, in the economy is that very small companies tend to work on margin and very large companies tend to work on volume. And the ideal mix of the two is somewhere in between where you have a decent margin and growing volumes. So uh, this is what I call the profit continuum in real terms. And then you have three kinds of money. Mises uh, wrote this in 1912, commodity money, credit money, and fiat money. And you can also put them on a continuum. And this is a nominal continuum, the monetary continuum. So on the left hand side, you have barter money, which has no collateral that this could be anything uh, from fish, which is not very good money to gold, which is very good money. Um, and at first appearance, it does not have any collateral. And on the other side, you have fiat money, which neither has any collateral. It's just the dictate from the state. 
saying that this is our national currency. And what is the collateral of that? It appears it doesn't have any. But if you really think about it, even barter money has collateral, namely the belief that what has value today will still have value tomorrow. Why does gold have value? Mises says it's the regression theory, theorem. I say it's the progression theory. It's because we believe that tomorrow people will still value gold. And so the collateral of barter money to me is the trust of one person in many people. Fiat money is just the other way around. There, uh, there's also collateral, namely the trust of many people in one person, namely the central banker. The trust that in those is the trust of many, many. Now, the question is, how are the real, the real continuum of the economy related to the nominal continuum of the money? So if you look at inflation and deflation that way, um, my definition of inflation is the forced injection of fiat money, so base money coming from the central bank, into the fiduciary money supply. And this will, of course, frustrate all the uh, full reserve bankers. And I'm very happy to do that because I do not believe anything about full reserve banking nor about fractional reserve banking. I think this is a total misnomer of the debate, but we can come to that in the questions. And what happens? This is the nominal uh, uh, thing that happens. What happens in the real economy when you inject water into the economic milk? Well, the first question is, where does that money enter? Will it enter with the small companies who often don't have a lot of capital requirements? Will it enter with the medium sized companies who do have capital requirements, but often come from a history of a small company and have saved? Or does it go to the large companies? Well, Asking the question is answering it. Um, what you will see is a shift in the market composition because uh, it will be injected in the companies that have uh, the highest volume. And in the beginning, I thought this is because their cash flows are bigger. But talking to bankers, they told me, no, no, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the, with the administration cost of a loan. If I have to make uh, uh, one loan to 100 or 10 loans, if I, if I have to loan 100 million euros to 10 companies, or 100 million euro to 100 companies, I prefer lending them out or lending them out to 10 companies. Why? Because the administration cost is much lower. It's that simple. So what happens when you inject uh, money here? You get um, an unfair competition because this is a capital subsidy. And what do the biggest companies do? They actually make prices go down. Uh, they um, can do uh, uh, price wars with, uh, let's say, family companies who have not, mm, who do not have such an access to the, the, the banking system. And so inflation, strangely enough, makes prices of middle class consumer goods drop. In the end, of course not. In the end, the, the prices rise, but we are not interested in the end. That is a static view. We are interested in the dynamic view. What is the process? How does it take place? And this is how it takes place. If the market shifts towards different profit combinations, then some loans that have been taken out by medium sized companies can no longer be paid. So the collateral they offered for those um, loans is endangered. And that is what I call deflation. That is what I call deflation. We will come to that. So let's first see what the effects are on the market composition. What happens first? The family businesses, you could say that the small companies, those are the freelancers. The, the medium companies are the family businesses, let's say two, three, four generations. And then the very large companies, well, they don't have a soul. They are multinationals. They are owned by a multitude of people. There is no link between the sociology and the economics of it. But what happens is the middle class families go bankrupt or they uh, take on more loans and they specialize. But that is just a, 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 a stay of execution because if the interest rate goes down even further, they will even lose that war. So what is the second uh, effect? The multinationals consolidate their monopoly. Uh, they will use part of the profits that they have um, conquered by, let's say, predatory practices 
And I'm, I'm, I know I'm sounding like a socialist, but you don't have to be a socialist to see that uh, inflation is actually uh, changing the market composition. They consolidate that. And how do they do that? They use part of the money for compliance, which, which means that um, all kinds of regulations are being voted in parliaments to, um, ins uh, um, to ensure the safety of people, quality requirements, all kinds of that. And I used to think that compliance officers are people who make sure that people uh, that uh, companies are in order with all the rules. No, it's it's much worse. They actually write the rules, so they fence off the market, and they are part of the state in the end. And then another phenomenon is that the free the people who have a job you're only free if you don't have a job if you have capital. So my definition of deflation is the inevitable failing of middle class loans. So the evaporation of the water is actually the evaporation of the collateral below fiduciary media. And so if you take a metric, I said we could not measure it, but this, these are uh, uh, the figures for, for Belgium for the, for the loans that failed. If you look at uh, 2000, the, the loans that failed were about between 25 and 3%. Um, the, the graph only runs until, until 2017. Uh, but I'm I'm quite sure that now with, with the coronavirus, I think that are happening, I see going up. What does that mean? Prevent banks from crashing because if they have a non-performing loan on their balance sheet, normally what you have to do is write it off on the on the on the active side and on the passive side, you have to. You know, lick, or on the active side, you have to liquidate some of the, their investments. And if they would have to do that, they would go bankrupt. So uh, Lady Lagarde just prints whatever is needed. And so another cycle starts. The forced injection of fiat money into the fiduciary money supply. The inevitable failing of middle class loans, which is deflation. And the proliferation of freelance individuals. And the end result is that the, 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 the family companies, the, the, the middle class companies are just, you know, eradicated and the only thing you will have is elephants and mosquitoes the elephants are the are the large multinationals and the freelance individuals will soon learn that they have no bargaining power whatsoever because the the, the number of people who can give them a job is uh, uh, much much less than when the middle class companies would still uh, be alive so another cycle starts and in the end uh, what bankers do, central bankers do, and I know, Roman, that you are a central banker as well, but you're not evil, you are with us, but I, I do think that, <laughs> that Ms. Lagarde uh, perfectly knows what is going on. Uh, their definition of deflation is a general drop in the price level, but that is not what they are concerned about. They don't care. What they really care about is the evaporation of collateral, the deflation on the balances of banks, and that is what they uh, uh, print extra, 1.3 trillion euros. We're not talking about billions anymore, but trillions. And I'm telling you, it will become much, much, much worse in the future. So my conclusions, uh, the real role to serve them is uh, like this. Inflation causes a drop in the price level. The drop in the price level causes deflation. And the deflation in the end causes the rise in the price level. Why? Because of inflation? No, because the market is shared between two or three big companies who, in the end, uh, you know, rise prices far above uh, uh, what the market level would, would, would need and they can prevent new market entry because of uh, their regulations. They are part of the state, in, in fact. Second, uh, I think my, my definition of inflation, um, the inevitable, inevitable evaporation of middle class collateral is uh, valuable. We can discuss that. And third, the remedy is just to abolish all central banks. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brecht, for your stimulating uh, talk. Maybe one remark I would uh, do to your, um, to your uh, uh, statement that central banks uh, do not care really about falling prices, but about uh, um, the stability of the banking system. I think to, I agree with that, but I think both are related is because if you have deflation, then uh, the um, the charge or the, the ability of agents to repay uh, debt is uh, getting worse and worse. So uh, then if you have a debt deflation spiral, of course, the entire banking system would, uh, would be in a big trouble. So I think to, to some extent they are related and uh, it's not, 
well, I think it's, we can argue that they care about both at the same time because they are very much related. Maybe another another comment on the, I think on your, the question of what is the definition of inflation, of course, to some extent, it is a semantic. It seems that over the ages, um, the definition of inflation has uh, changed. Before it was an increase in money, now it is an increase in price level. Um, I agree that there is, of course, uh, that, but... Yes, well, on your first remark, I think it's very important to always keep in mind that uh, a, a general rise in the price level is only the end product of a process. No, no prices rise all at the same time. You have to track how the prices, the relative price structure changes. And that's just the same for deflation. So I, I acknowledge that central bankers do care for, for, for too much deflation. Now in the Eurozone, we are negative inflation. <laughs> they do care about that. But where does it come from? You have to look, where does it come from? It comes from failing loans in the middle class companies. Yeah, and they, don't yeah. they, they only care about the stability of the banking system. They don't care about middle class companies. I'm not saying that the national banks, but the European Central Bank, for instance, I don't see any, you know, you know, concern for, if they would be concerned, they would stay home and not come, come to work. Maybe I'm a, a bit radical, but I think this is the good venue to be radical. I'm not sure if there are any more questions. If not, I guess after such a stimulating and some perhaps provocative talk, we should have some more questions. <laughs> so one uh, question by uh, uh, do you do you see the question? Is asking, are you long term optimistic? Uh, no, <laughs> no, I'm not. I think uh, the uh, in December it's not a, it's not an exact prediction, but if I calculate the the, the deflation, so the non-performing loans, what the banking system prediction? It's difficult to make prediction, especially about the future. But what do you say? Does the system hold 10, 20 more years? It depends on the on the on the level of cre credulity of the population, and it depends on the effectiveness of the propaganda. People have to be, um, this, um, how do you say that, um, have to uh, divert their attention towards climate change, terrorism, the virus, whatever comes up in, in the media, but never ever talk about the fact that negative interest rates are here to stay, that negative interest rates are coming to your bank account. So if people would really realize what is going on, you know, I think... I think Henry Ford said it once, if people would know the, the true nature of the monetary system, they will, there will be a revolution tomorrow. And it's just because there is not no knowledge about how inflation and deflation just kills the middle class. You know, they are like, in, in Spanish they say borregos, they are like sheep uh, going to the slaughter. So as long as, the, as, the, as people believe that the system is solvent, it will be solvent. It, I'm a subjectivist, so what do you want? Yes, and as uh, Ludwig von Mises said, economic knowledge necessarily lead to liberalism. So I don't know if you have some more questions from the audience. I see. You have one question about uh, yeah, investment <laughs> art. How to make art. money? Well, then that's why you take a subscription on macro trends because this theory I apply it to investing. So I will not answer this here. <laughs> You have to pay for the for the economic or investor letters uh, of Brecht to to know he's inside. <laughs> I will reinvest it in this conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if you don't have any further questions, I would like to thank again. Uh, maybe one more questions uh, because about. Um, and that was the question, I think, uh, not to, to Dante, I think. Uh, I don't know, you said you said that the question of full reserve and fraction banking is, is a wrong debate. I didn't also get that. Why? It seems to me to be an important question so because it's what determines yes. whether private property rights are respected or not. But what is your view on that? I, I want to, that's the, 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 the presentation I want to do next year. The, the debate between the full reserve bankers and the fractional reserve bankers um, uh, starts from the premise that loans are provided from reserves. And that is not the case. The case is that when you enter a bank, 
People think that they go into a bank to, to obtain a credit. No, you have credit before you enter the bank and you sell that credit for money. So, so what, what banks do is actually they liquidate your illiquid credit because if I'm Brecht Arnard with a credit score wanting 7,000 euros at 3% a year for five years and another one, uh, you know, it's very individual. So what do you do? You liquidate that into one unit, which is a euro. So uh, I'm a subjectivist. I believe that um, um, the, in a free market, uh, banks will produce uh, money um, based on the collateral they get. And so um, the idea that there should be a debate between fractional reserve, that, that the reserves are, that the function of the reserves is to serve as the collateral for money, no. That's not how it works. The function of reserves is to have a check on a bank that expands too much. If a bank has been too loose in giving loans and has a lot of deflation, so a lot of failing non-performing loans, then people will more uh, rapidly get their reserves from the bank and that's when banks crash. But the function of reserves is not to emit loans. Loans are emit emitted on the basis of good collateral. And that's how the system works, but it has been you know, manipulated by central banks who um, use uh, not the the collateral of um, of. Uh, I see that uh, that Dr. Huerta de Soto has joined the conversation, and now he will lambast me for my for my thoughts. But I, I that's what I think. To sonido, sonido. Yeah. Sorry. No, that, hello, hello, and. Uh, to everybody that I, I, I want to tell you that I'm feeling much better, although I must be in the hospital for uh, the next few days. Uh, the problem was uh, related with the, the model, so it's a barro. The mud, mud in my uh, gallbladder that uh, produced uh, a, a, a light pancreatitis, and I must be here uh, improving little by little the next few days, but I feel much better now. Anyhow, I, I did not want to interrupt you, Brecht. I only wanted to hear your main conclusions. But I say <laughs> you hello to everybody. Hello, get well better. So please continue, Brecht. Please continue. Go ahead. Oh, I actually finished. Everybody can, can uh, give his good regards to uh, get well fast. Uh, no, I have finished. Uh, I think the fractional reserve versus full reserve banking uh, debate should be revisited uh, based on the premise that um, the production of money is not based on the reserves a bank has, but on the collateral it accepts. This discount banking, actually. Okay. So, okay, thank you very much, Brecht, for your presentation. And uh, Professor Weta de Soto, we all, all participants wish you a good improvement in the next day, and we look forward to meet you again next year, of course, in person in Madrid. And as I said, so thank you very much to all the presenters of the first uh, session, to Pavel, Dante, and Brecht. And now we have about um, 10 minutes break, and I guess we are starting the second session at about a couple of minutes after uh, three o'clock. So thank you very much, and see you in about 10 minutes. Okay, I'm, I'm looking, before I, say, I tell you bye-bye, I'm looking forward to hear my daughter's presentation. <laughs> uh, I'm very sorry of not delivering it personally, but because, uh, but I do not have enough strength to do it. Eh? But anyhow, uh, I see you at, uh, it is at 17.30, uh, isn't it? Well. Yes, yeah, it is at uh, half past five, yes. You look great. To see you again another year. Eh? Thank yeah, you very much. The same for the same okay. for. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. So thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.